Uh, Dr. Allen has broad range of experiences from overseeing Scottish water scientific uh, Scottish water scientific services, drinking water quality programs, and public health protection, to delivering uh, renewable energy projects and other, and other commercial businesses. He is currently chairman of uh, the Strategic Advisory Board and Women European Committee for Standardization. His current focus is on sustainable rural water systems, which includes decentralized wastewater treatment systems, anaerobic digestion, water safety planning, and removal of substances of high concern and natural organic matter from uh, drinking water. Uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Allen to the stage. Okay, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd just like to start off by adding my thanks to the rest of the speakers. I think uh, Atri have done a fantastic job this week. Uh, the hospitality has been uh, phenomenal. I think the, the event's been really interesting. I personally have learned quite a lot uh, listening to the very uh, entertaining and interesting talks. So thanks very much for inviting me here to speak today. It's been really appreciated. So uh, I'm going to take you through a very, very quick, uh, very high level uh, talk about the work that we do in sustainable rural communities. And I'm going to take you to Scotland, um, and you wonder, perhaps wonder why this is relevant to India, but I'll, I'll come on to draw in some of the, uh, some of the parallels that we can, uh, we can think about and take some of the learnings. But one of the things about this talk is that it's really focusing in at a very local level. So we've heard a lot about uh, the kind of macro scale uh, water security issues, but this is about delivering sustainable drinking water at a very local level. But a lot of the similar things apply, so the water food energy nexus, good regulations, uh, sensible policies, and, and all of these good, good things. So what I'll do very quickly is I'll just introduce the James Hutton Institute. So many of you probably have never heard of the James Hutton Institute. Um, we're, we're an institute very similar to A3, in fact, in that we, uh, we look uh, principally at environmental, agriculture, and sustainability research. Um, we're based in Scotland, clearly, but we do do projects here in India, in Africa, China, South America. So we are a kind of global organisation. Um, there's about 500 scientists, uh, and we're multidisciplinary, covering uh, natural sciences, social sciences and economics. And we run about 138 PhDs at any one time. Um, and we do, we do have a lot of visiting researchers, and we're based across a number of sites, which look like that. So I actually work at the Invergowrie Dundee um, site, which is actually a working farm. Uh, we have about 300 or so acres on that site, and we principally do research into potatoes, barley, and uh, soft fruit growing at that place. But you can see that we've got a range of farms, all with different conditions, so we can do long-term agricultural research over a range of crops and a range of conditions. So I'm actually looking after CRU, which is the Centre for Expertise for Water, and it's really a policy uh, research vehicle. It's one of four centres for expertise in Scotland. Uh, and really, it's about informing policy. So we are de uh, we're developing an evidence base that the policymakers in Scotland can use to actually create policy. So I think the policymakers have recognised that good science and a good evidence base should be informing the policies going forward. And it's all co-produced, and we work with many stakeholders across Scotland to make sure we're delivering targeted research. So in terms of the position of our research, um, really you've got fundamental research which may take a long time. So things like potato growing and crop growing takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. And then in Scotland we have a thing called a strategic research programme, which is a relatively short-term programme, and it looks around a five-year time horizon. And then there's crew, and crew's very agile, so we spend about a million pounds a year on, on uh, short-term research, which normally lasts between any, anywhere between three months and about a year. And then the output of that informs the strategic programme and informs the longer-term research that's required. So we've got a very niche kind of area of, of research. But anyway, moving on to the kind of topic itself, uh, sustainable rural communities is one of four themes that we look after. So within crew, we have sustainable rural communities with drinking water quality, flood risk management, and catchment management. Um, but for the sustainable rural communities, in order to research it, we have to come up with a definition of what we mean by sustainable. So we've taken, uh, we've taken a loosely based definition based on the Bristol Accord, which really suggests that sustainable communities should be active, inclusive, and safe. 
They should be well run, well connected. They should be well served, but equally environmentally sensitive. They should be thriving and they should be well designed and built. And uh, ultimately, there should be social justice and fairness for everyone within the community. So I think that's a good basis for the, for, for the kind of delivery of research. But in this, in this talk, we're talking about water. So in Scotland specifically, uh, about 97% um, of the population is covered by the publicly owned uh, utility that I worked for called Scottish Water. So that's a government organisation. It's got around 3,500 staff and we cover about 5 million customers. And we do, we do actually cover both water and wastewater services. And we're actually the fourth largest water company in the UK by size. Um, but we account for about a third of the land mass of the UK itself. Um, so within that, there's a range of assets, and I won't read this out uh, verbatim, but you can see that there's a lot of assets that need to be managed across the geographical area of Scotland. Um, and we supplied about 844 million litres of water per day uh, to domestic customers and a further 455 million litres to uh, non-domestic or business use customers. So there's a fair amount of clean water, and all that water is uh, treated to uh, drinking water standards set by the European Commission and translated into local law. So in order to do that, uh, Scottish Water typically spend around £500 million per annum on capital investment and infrastructure. Uh, so that's servicing about 5 million people. And the operating costs are about £280 million uh, per annum. So that, I mean, really what I want to show you there is that there's a lot of effort and a lot of money spent on making sure that we've got a really good, robust public water supply. And the regulatory structure for that is very, very strict. So Scottish Water as a single entity is regulated by an economic regulator, an environment regulator, and a drinking water quality regulator. And the tension between the three regulatory groups uh, leads to a really well-defined asset management plan that allows us to achieve compliance with water quality to sort of 99.96, 99.9, which is really, uh, really very, very good. But uh, in contrast, I'm going to talk about the rural supplies which are largely um, privately owned boreholes. So the majority of the water supplied to these private systems are uh, individual people or groups of people who actually own the borehole supply themselves. And that accounts for around 3% of the population of Scotland. So it's around about 150,000 people. Um, and we can categorise these supplies into type A and type B, uh, just for simplicity, where the type A supplies are either commercial properties or their um, supplies that deliver greater than 10 megalitres per day and serve greater than 50 population equivalent. So they are relatively small. And type B supplies are really where you've got an individual property uh, that's got its own borehole supply and its own septic tank system. And uh, it's just a single family using that supply. So there's less rigour in terms of regulation required for those. But overall, uh, there's about 2,500 type A supplies and about 18,000 type B supplies. And these are relatively well understood. Now, within the context of safe and secure water, uh, we do think about safe sanitation, uh, but I don't go into that in detail in this presentation. But we have around about 160 to 170,000 um, septic tanks that service this private community. So there's a lot of septic tanks that need to be regulated and maintained as well. So we have to think about the whole system, but today I'm focusing on private water supplies. But in contrast with the public supply, you can see that in actual fact compliance with drinking water quality regulations is very low. So each of these systems needs to be risk assessed. And uh, really, you're talking about maximum 90% compliance for type A supplies, which is, very, uh, is, is not really good at all. And typically, you'll find about 20 of these supplies contain E. coli, which is obviously quite a concern. Um, and with the type A supply, sorry, it's about 14%, type B is 20%. So that's what it looks like in the map. So these, the darker blue areas of Scotland are where there's a bigger concentration of private supplies and small supplies. And it doesn't correlate with the, the, um, the population centres. The main population centres are actually in the light blue area where there's a higher concentration of public supplies, which makes complete sense. And the island, the island groups are all in light blue because there was a lot of investment went into the islands to bring them up to drinking water quality standards, which was very important. But if we, if we flip it along one, we, we do a lot of work at looking and analysing the failures that we get at these private supplies. So this is, again, specifically the private water supply failures. 
So one of the projects we did was we actually mapped out data going back to 2006. So there's about 10 years worth of data in these, in these slides. And we started to cluster the uh, microbiology failures and layer on things like chemical failures and other physical parameter failures. And we can start to see where the hotspots are. And clearly in the Aberdeen area that I'm showing you here, um, you can see there's a high concentration of failures. And this is also linked to agricultural activity because the highest proportion of agricultural activity in Scotland is also in the Aberdeenshire area. So the two, you, know, you get back into the scenario where agriculture and uh, human use and land use and water use all start to link in together, very similar to previous talks. But with this, we can actually, we can actually drive down into the postcode area. So what, what we did once we had uh, got all these failures, we started to look at risk assessments, uh, which then informs uh, another strategy about how we can regulate these things. So this is an example of one of the risk assessments we did for E. coli, but we've got a whole range of these, uh, th these um, risk assessments for many, many other uh, types of bacteria, protozoa, viruses, and so on. And again, I, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but you can see that really if we take a, a, a 12 million people exposed to the total water of Scotland, and that includes visitors and tourists and everybody, that's why it's greater than the population of Scotland, you can see that, that really there's 162 uh, cases probability out of 12 million. So it's still relatively low, even though the failures are actually relatively high. So just an example of some of these private supplies. Um, th this is why some of the failures occur. They're not particularly well managed. So you see in the bottom left-hand picture, right-hand picture, the sheep are above the tank and there's no protection. So there's a very high, uh, high chance of uh, bacteria from sheep uh, fecal matter going into the... Into the, uh, into the supply. You've got crack lids on the one in the top uh, left, so you can easily get uh, vermin and all sorts of things going into the tank. Uh, the little run of river at the bottom uh, left-hand corner, um, that's just abstracting from a burn. There's lots of sheep and cattle and deer and everything. Um, and the only treatment that the, uh, we have on that one there is the farmer took a pair of his wife's stockings and put it over the intake pipe and he called that filtration. So <laughs> that's, the, that's, the total, that's the total amount of treatment. So anyway, I realise that I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to skip on to some of the solutions and the way we tackle some of the detailed research about how we get these up to compliance. So we, we've had a lot of stakeholder meetings and we realised that engaging the community is critical. We need to assess innovation, so we need to look at where we can apply innovation to make improvements. Uh, we need to create you know, really good regulation that supports uh, improvements and drives behaviours that right way. We need to become a lot more resource efficient. Uh, we, we need to really understand the true economic costs. Uh, I'll say a bit more about that later. But it's the true economic costs of managing the supply. But more importantly, it's about understanding the economic costs and the constraints that puts on advancing the, the, the e economy of the rural community. So where you've got things like whiskey production and agriculture in competition for the water, what does that do to constrain the opportunity for the community to grow? So what we did was we came up with a delivery framework uh, that centres around the community. So we call this community pilots, and we took four areas of Scotland. Um, but basically we set up a range of projects which uh, develop the evidence base, but look at the regulations that govern it, uh, look at the business models that are applied, consider innovation uh, and solutions, and look at this closed-loop resource balancing kind of sucker economy um, type approach and see if we could actually close the loop. And the outcomes we were looking for were clearly improved water quality, uh, changing in attitudes and understanding the behaviours within the community, and ultimately e increasing the economic benefits to the community itself. So engaging the community, as I say, we, we talked to four different communities across Scotland, and it's important to understand that they were chosen because they had very different features. So some, some of the communities had very powerful landowners and a lot of tenants. Uh, some communities were actually operating and functioning as a, as, a, as a very coherent group, and there was lots of uh, friendships in the community, and they worked very well together. And then the other two communities we had were somewhere in between the two, but they all had very distinct features on them. Um, so that was the first one, and we, we ran a series of workshops and we tried to understand uh, their, th their priorities, and from that, that informed some of the other projects that we did, and I'll talk a little bit about that as I get to the end of the presentation. So the next question is, is this uh, closed-loop 
system possible. So we looked at we looked at things like the energy flows and systems, and we looked at a single property system, a small village, and then a r larger urban system. And what we were able to do with that was we were able to create these uh, flow diagrams, uh, which showed us the general direction of nutrients. Now we're using phosphorus here, but uh, obviously there's more than just phosphorus, there's nitrogen and so on. But what we do is the little pictures that you see uh, represent a series of activities. And I've got a flow diagram that builds up uh, each of these activities. But again, I don't have time to go into the detail. But you can see that when you start to add in the different activities, you can see a positive or negative flow of phosphorus or energy. And we can start to think about the balances. And we can add in things like uh, you know, energy for wastewater systems where there's a lot more pumping costs, there's a lot more cost of aeration and so on. And so we can start to see where all the gaps are, and then we can start to build um, some flow diagrams like this where we can start to budget for phosphorus and for energy within the system. And the thicker lines at the top, which represent agriculture, clearly show that phosphorus is a, kind of a key area there. OK, so I've just got a few more slides. So we take all of that and uh, we start to assess innovation. And there's a little picture there of wind turbines in the sea, which is good for renewable energy, but maybe less good for the environment. So we needed a way of actually working out whether the technology is ultimately a benefit and whether the community like to use it. So very similar to yesterday's talk, we applied an MCA uh, approach. Again, I won't go into the detail of that. But we considered things like cost uh, and ease of use, acceptability to the community, the cost of maintenance and the kind of interdependencies. And we looked at things like uh, multiple stage treatments. So we, we created a very complex statistical model uh, that we could actually generate numbers from, which were numbers that the community recognised. And it meant that we could sit down with the community and with the regulators and with other stakeholders and actually get them to see which steps and which series of innovation actually met their needs at a local level. And each system is different, so we recognise that each community has different priorities, so we can adjust the MCA analysis to account for that. So the last two slides, um, the outcomes uh, were that really people, when we talked to people through the community exercise, they were ultimately concerned with quality and quantity, and there were often tensions in the community arose when their neighbours started using more water than uh, them, and then they lost water and so on. Um, but when we talked about treatment, affordability and willingness to pay are two critical areas, and I go back to the economic uh, argument. There's a real need for investment in grant aid, and these are strate strategically important, but unfortunately, as with many other countries, uh, water and sanitation is often down the priority, and things like hospitals and education are, are far higher. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, assessing the appropriateness of technology uh, with the community uh, helps gain acceptance. So the communities themselves really liked the fact that we were presenting them with selections of choices of innovation and they could help choose and uh, make choices to, that improved their water quality. And it got away from the fact that people were coming in and trying to do things to them, which uh, really they don't like at all. But there is a, there is a choice between decentralised solutions and, and uh, centralised solutions. And so it really, the next stage of our research is to understand the point at which decentralised is better than centralised and vice versa. But again, ultimately, no two catchments are the same. So finally, uh, really, I, again, I said to you that I would make some uh, kind of comparisons with India. And there are many issues within rural communities, but many are the same. So things like limited resources, limited funding, uh, consistent application of regulations, uh, the remoteness of uh, the locations and uh, these kind of things, hierarchies within the community, these are all very important features of the work that we do that are the same in many jurisdictions, including India. So I think that a lot of the kind of work that we, we do and the way we structure the policy research could be applied to different countries if they wish to do that. And with that, thanks for listening. And there you go. Thank you. Uh, argument. There's a real need for investment in grant aid, and these are strate strategically important. But unfortunately, as with many other countries, uh, water and sanitation is often down the priority, and things like hospitals and education are, are far higher. So that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, assessing the appropriateness of technology uh, with the community uh, helps gain acceptance. So the communities themselves really liked the fact that we were presenting them with selections of choices of innovation, and they could help choose 
and uh, make choices to, that improved their water quality. And it got away from the fact that people were coming in and trying to do things to them, which uh, really they don't like at all. But there is a, there is a choice between decentralised solutions and, and uh, centralised solutions. And so it really, the next stage of our research is to understand the point at which decentralised is better than centralised and vice versa. But again, ultimately, no two catchments are the same. So finally, uh, really, I, again, I said to you that I would make some uh, kind of comparisons with India. And there are many issues within rural communities, but many are the same. So things like limited resources, limited funding, uh, consistent application of regulations, uh, the remoteness of uh, the locations, and uh, these kind of things, hierarchies within the community, these are all very important features of the work that we do that are the same in many jurisdictions, including India. So I think that a lot of the kind of work that we, we do and the way we structure the policy research could be applied to different countries if they wish to do that. And with that, thanks for listening, and there you go. Thank you.